you'd like to open your Bibles to Esther chapter 6, continuing the series with Esther. So Esther chapter 6, as I read. That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded that Mordecai had exposed Bichthanar and Teresh, two of the king's officers, who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honour, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. This is God's word. Okay, I can encourage you to keep uh, your Bibles open to Esther chapter 6 if you haven't got it open and you're just listening. Um, can I encourage you to open it now so you can follow along as we move uh, through it? Just before we jump in, I, I found it quite interesting uh, of recent to hear how much more the subject of the second coming has been in discussion amongst Christians, talking to Christians from our church after the service or talking to Christians, other Christian friends from other churches, just how much more the subject has come up over the last two years. And it seems things that are going on tend to end up uh, with that subject. So discussing the pandemic, uh, discussing the wars that are going on, discussing what some of the superpower nations of the world are doing at the moment, Uh, certain political leaders and the pushes that they are bringing. Uh, It it seems that these sort of subjects, even the kind of shift in morality and societal values, just this uh, really uh, great shift that we see in society. And these things, the conversation tends up uh, leading to uh, Jesus must be coming back soon. It's as if the world is spinning completely out of control Uh, Therefore, this must mean that Jesus is coming back. It's just so terrible at the moment. But our passage uh, reminds us tonight that God hasn't taken annual leave at the moment. And his office isn't closed. He hasn't clocked off at the moment. Um, And he hasn't let go of the steering wheel. Actually, the passage shows us the opposite, that 
in the chaos, he's working in the details. So he's working in the most smallest parts of life that is going on, and he's working it all towards a grand finale. But it's in the details, the things that we don't even take notice of. While we're looking at all the big things going on, in the small details, God is working. So we're going to see that in this passage. But uh, before we do, let's pray and ask that God will give us eyes to see into the details uh, this evening. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for our service, our worship service so far uh, tonight. Thank you for the time in communion to remember Christ. Uh, thank you for us singing uh, that, that opportunity to worship you in that way and the reading of your word. And we just pray now as, as the word of God is opened up, we pray, Lord, that you would give us opened ears and, Lord, that we would just have a uh, fixated mind upon upon you lord help us to be sensitive to your leading and we just pray we're not unaware that satan seeks to bring so many distractions he hates this book and we know that he hates us and so we just pray that you would by your holy spirit draw us right into your very presence this evening help us to hear you speaking and we pray that you would show yourself in your great glory Bring us great encouragement and challenge us, Lord, where we need it. You know exactly where we're at in our life. You know exactly what we need to know. You know exactly where we need to go. You alone have the remedy. Help us to hear tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we open up uh, exit, uh, Esther 6, we're going to divide the text up into uh, three parts as we work through it. Our first point this evening, if you're taking notes, uh, if you're jotting it down, our first point is an unexpected night. An unexpected night. Now, just the context up to this point, uh, the story, things are very dark and bleak at the moment with, with where we're moving. The clock is ticking at the moment, and it's ticking to Israel's destruction. The decree's been signed, and in just a matter of months, the Jews are going to be annihilated. So this is all happening. Slowly, slowly, it's approaching that day. But there's another clock that is simultaneously ticking, and it's moving even quicker, and the sand is almost out in that hourglass. If Israel have only a few months to live, then Mordecai only has a few hours. He he literally has a few hours. Look at chapter 5, the last verse in chapter 5, where uh, Ian had left off um, last week. Verse 14, last verse there. Haman's wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, this is to Haman, have a gallows built 23 meters high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go, um, then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the gallows built. So this is where we're at at the moment. Now, the next day Esther, where we're at, the next day Esther would be holding Banquet part two, the second night. Now, perhaps somehow she is able to convince the king to repeal the decision and not go through with the execution. Perhaps she can do this. There is still a little bit of time for the Jews, still a few months away. But there's no time left for Mordecai. There is absolutely no time. Esther doesn't even know that 75-foot high gallows have been built ready to go in the morning for her cousin Mordecai to be hanged upon. She has no clue about this. In the middle of the night, Esther has no idea. Mordecai has no idea what he's going to be waking up to. And the king's favorite man, Haman, when the sun comes up in that morning, the next morning, the king's favorite man, Haman, is going to be waiting there, ready to make the request to have Mordecai hanged. Now, it's literally just physically impossible for Mordecai to be spared at the moment. There's just no, humanly speaking, there's no time. There is no time. And yet what is impossible with man is possible with God. A continued theme. So even for the God whose name is not mentioned once in this book, he will remain the main character of this book, and he will refuse to take a back seat in everything that's going on here. 
even though time is running out. So the impossible will be made possible, and it's going to be made possible through the most spectacularly mundane way. And that's going to be how God gets the glory through it. So let's look at verse 1, how it starts off. Just those first few words, very interesting. That night, the king could not sleep. That's how, we, that's, that's how we launched off. Before the big day, before the sun comes up, the king can't sleep. Why can't he sleep? What's going on with him? He had the, he had the banquet just that night. The wine would have been flowing. It should be easy to sleep after all of that wine. What's the problem? And he has the comfiest bed in the Persian Empire. Five stars is putting it mildly. I mean, he has luxury like no one else knew. Why can't he sleep? What's the problem? Is it too hot? Is he feeling unwell? Is he stressed out? What's going on? You may be thinking, well, big deal if he had a bad sleep. Bad sleeps are as common as the common cold, right? Which one of us doesn't have a bad night's sleep occasionally? Yes, that's true. But in the Bible, when we have instances where it says um, a king can't sleep, the Bible gives us a reason. There is a specific reason why they, that king can't sleep. Now, let me give you an example. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has disturbing dreams. So disturbing, after that he can't sleep anymore. And then when you go to Daniel chapter 6, King Darius... Daniel has been thrown into the lion's den. He loves Daniel. And that whole night while Daniel's in there, it says Darius, he cannot sleep because he's so anxious for Daniel. There were reasons. And yet here in Esther chapter 6, we're given no reason. Nothing why the king, no explicit reason why the king can't fall asleep. And yet the, the biblical author, he drops us a clue. He drops us a clue. When couldn't the king sleep? When? That night. That night he couldn't sleep. What night? The eve of Mordecai's execution. The night before Mordecai is killed. The night that the gallows were built. That's when the king can't sleep. So to the king, when he's in bed and he's restless, it's just an ordinary night for him. He can't sleep. He's got no idea gallows have been built, and he's got no idea that when the sun comes up, Haman's going to be waiting with a request. Esther, she's got no idea that her cousin's going to die the next day. She's got no idea the gallows have been built. Mordecai has no idea that all this is unfolding. No one does, but God knows. God knows what's going on. God knows it's the eve of Mordecai's execution. God knows, and God will get to the king before Haman does. God will beat him there. And thus, this becomes the perfect moment in the book of Esther for the biblical author to finally mention God's name. Here is the spot. God's keeping the king awake. God's not giving him sleep. God doesn't want him to fall asleep. God is at work. And yet the Holy Spirit restrains the biblical author. And he wants to keep portraying God as the invisible hand that is at work behind the scenes. He wants to keep that going on. See, he is the God who can part the Red Sea. He is that God, but he's also the God who works in the most mundane aspects of our life, even our sleep patterns. That's what he wants us to see. So God will cause something as ordinary as a sleepless night to be the major catalyst for bringing deliverance for his people. That's what he's doing. So what did powerful kings in the ancient world, what did they do when they couldn't sleep in the middle of the night? What would they do? Well, we know from historical records, sometimes they would call for light music to be played, some light entertainment. Sometimes they would call for women dancers. And you know, these kings, this king had a whole harem of women who were on call 24-7 whenever he wanted them. But the king doesn't want any of that this time. And he doesn't want to count sheep to help him fall asleep. He doesn't want to do that. He wants something unexpected. Look at verse 1. That night, 
the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. So he calls for his attendants to come into his room and to read to him from the book of the Chronicles. Now, what are the book of the Chronicles? It's not what we have in our Bible Chronicles. It is a record book of his reign. So the book contains documentation of all his feats, his triumphs, a lot of his projects, transactions, basic admin details, things that have been recorded during his reign. Pretty boring book. And it seems out of the ordinary, an unlikely choice, unexpected. Why would he do this? But notice, out of all the pages of his multiple-year reign at this point, where do the attendants land on? What page do they land on? What do they start reading? Look at verse 2. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. Now, we, we, we read about that, that event that happened, the assassination attempt. We read about that back in chapter 2. Remember Mordecai, the Jew, he's at the gate, king's gate, and he overhears two of the officers who hate the king, and they start talking about, okay, which one of us is going to slip the knife into the king, or which one's going to slip a, a pill into his drink? And Mordecai hears this, that they're going to plan to kill the king. He goes to Queen Esther and tells her about this, and then she goes and tells the king. And the two officers who plan the assassination are hung on gallows, and the king is saved. Now, this event was recorded by the king's scribes in the book of the Chronicles, this event where the king's life was saved. So think about the evening so far. That evening, Haman has the gallows for Mordecai built, ready for the next day to to kill Mordecai. He plans to get to the king at sunrise, first thing in the morning, to tell the king if he can hang Mordecai. That night, the king can't sleep. And that night, the king asks, not for dancers, not for all his women, but he asks for the record book of his reign. And when the attendants read from that book, they land on the page with the account of when Mordecai saved the king's life from assassination. And as you look at this, as you look at this, this is again the perfect time for the biblical author to say, Behold God at work. Look at what God's doing behind the scenes. He's incredible. And yet the Holy Spirit restrains him and wants you to marvel at the unseen hand of God. Just working where no one can see. There's no parting of the Red Seas. No plagues. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, but... but He directs it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. Our governments, our rulers, the kings, their hand, their heart is in the hand of the Lord. He's in control of them. So the king hears and reminded how hears and is reminded how his life has been saved. He was still a ruler. He was still breathing that night because his life was saved. Now the king's lying in bed. He may be frustrated because he can't fall asleep, but He's still alive. He still has a life. He's still king because of Mordecai. Now, in that context back then, when someone would save a king's life, it was important for the king to reward that person generously. Generously. Why is that? Because it encouraged other people to be faithful and loyal to the king. You know in those contexts how dangerous it was to be a king. People didn't like you. Kings used to be so paranoid that everyone wanted to kill them in their sleep. It was important if someone saved the king's life from assassination, you reward them handsomely so that others will do likewise if they find out something makes sense, right? And yet we, we, we have a historical record of this king, King Xerxes. Someone, a man saved on an occasion, saved his brother's life. The king's brother's life. You know what the king, you know what Xerxes did for that man? He made him the governor of the region of Cilicia. How's that for a reward? That giant province, the reward you're governor of that land now. Xerxes realizes though, he never personally thanked Mordecai. 
for saving his life. But he assumes that his officials and his attendants have, have, have seen to the case and have rewarded Mordecai handsomely. After all, it's been five years, five years since Mordecai saved his life. Look at verse 3. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. Now the king can't believe it. The king is in dismay. Nothing at all has been done for Mordecai. The only thing that was done is the story, the event was recorded in the king's book. That's it. No thanks or anything. And the king can't believe it. Someone has saved his life and not been rewarded for it. Can you imagine if this gets out into the city? There was a man who saved the king's life and the king didn't thank him. Which person is going to save the king next time? Who would save a king like that if there's no reward in it? Think about how Mordecai felt after saving the life of the king, receiving no recognition. Five years have passed. Imagine, he performs this righteous deed. He saves someone's life. Was it too much to receive a card in the mail? Thanks. You know, thank you. Is it, is it, is it too much for that? Even just that, Nothing. He gets nothing from the king. Actually, he gets worse than nothing from the king. What does he get? The same king ends up signing a decree to kill all of Mordecai's people. Would not Mordecai afterwards think, why on earth should I have saved such a wicked king? And I saved his life, and now he's going to kill my people, the Jews. And despite all that, After receiving no recognition, Mordecai has continued to serve the king for five years. And Mordecai, even up to this point, is still at the king's gate serving after the decree has been signed. What do we learn from this? What do we learn? We need to make sure we do good in this world, not so that we will be recognized, not so that we might get a reward or credit. We do good because it is good and right to do good. We do good because God is good. And when we do God, we reflect him in this world. Mordecai holds his post. So we've seen here, first point tonight, it's an unexpected night. Secondly, an unexpected day. An unexpected day. Morning is now breaking, and in the king's mind, there's not a moment to lose. Mordecai needs to be rewarded, he needs to be recorded quick. But the king, like always, he doesn't know what to do. As we've seen through the whole book, he doesn't know what to do. He needs his advisors. How should I go about fixing Mordecai up? So look what he says, verse 4. The king said to them, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. So the king needs advice ASAP. And who just so happens to walk into the king's palace when the king calls for someone? The king's favorite man, Haman. He's in, the, he's in the courts already. You know the saying, the early bird catches the worm? Or Haman's the first one in the palace courts this morning. And it's early, Haman's there. He's already dressed. He's had his breakfast. He's beat the traffic. He's got to the palace. He's first there. And he's ready to go. And he's already rehearsing his pitch to the king for the request to kill Mordecai. And he's waiting. He's ready to go. And he is that eager to kill Mordecai. He is that eager and he's that confident. The gallows are already built. Pastor Ian said it last week. He hasn't even got permission from the king yet. He's already had the gallows for Mordecai built. Haman's thinking, if if I requested for all the Jews to be killed and the king signed off on it, is he really going to say no to me if I ask for one person to be killed? He's so confident about this. And he has the gallows built. And the king asks, which of the advisors is in the court? Look at verse 5. What do the servants say? His attendants answered the king, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. It's extraordinary, isn't it? You look at it unfolding, it's extraordinary. Haman is eagerly waiting to see the king about Mordecai. And the king is now eagerly awaiting to see Haman about Mordecai. Two men 
wanting to see each other about Mordecai. And they couldn't want to see each other for more opposite reasons. Two men, by the providence of God, are going to come together to meet regarding the same man. God is working here. How unsearchable are his ways. How unsearchable are his judgments. There's a famous hymn for the oldies in the room. God moves in a mysterious way. And there's a line in there. It says, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. Every hour. God is working in each person in this event. He's raised up Esther, the orphan Jew, to become queen. He's used Mordecai to save the king's life. He's kept the king awake and he's led the king to the book and to the exact page so that the king can know the truth about his life. He's even working in wicked Haman. Haman means it for evil, but God wants him in the courtroom. God wants him in the palace court. And once again, you look at these interconnected events and you just want to scream out, now will you just mention God's name in this book? And the author refuses and says, I will not. Why? Why, Christian? God is working in every detail of your life. But here's what you need to understand. He's also working in unbelievers, in the wicked, in your neighbor, in your boss, in your colleague, in your unsafe family members. He is at work. And he's fulfilling his purposes. Trust him. As we look at this world, it looks like it's in chaos, like it's spiraling out of control. Can you understand? It's in perfect control. Perfect control. Everything, everyone is where they need to be at the right moment. This is our Father's world. It's our Father's world. Well, the story gets more remarkable. Verse 6. When Haman entered, the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, Who is there that the king would rather honor than me? Now, this conversation between Xerxes and Haman could have went a hundred different ways. And it could have went the opposite way if the king asked the question differently. Did you notice how the king cheekily asked the question? He intentionally leaves out the identity of the man that he wants to honor. He doesn't name that it's Mordecai. What does he say? What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? The man. Now, if the king said, what should be done for Mordecai, who I want to honor? What should be done for him? Then Haman's response that comes will be completely different. You want to honor Mordecai. Don't trust that man. He is wicked. He's deceitful. He's a troublemaker. He's insubordinate. He's rebellious. He doesn't follow orders. Doesn't matter what he did. He has a deceitful plan behind it. Don't trust him. The conversation would have went a completely different way. But by God's sovereignty, the king doesn't ask the question that way. He leaves out Mordecai's name. And he asked the question in such a way that will resonate with Haman's wicked heart. And, he, and unknowingly, he leads Haman like a moth to the flame by the way that he asked the question. Look at verse 6. Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he asked the question in such a way that it just grips Haman's pride. And he starts thinking immediately it's him. Now, Xerxes doesn't know Haman's heart, but God does. God knows exactly where Haman is. And so the conversation unfolds. And here we see pride. It's incredibly deceitful. This sin of pride, it convinced Haman that the king must be referring to him. The king must be wanting to reward me. After all, the night before, the king and queen had a banquet, and I was the only one to be invited with the king and queen of the empire. Just me. And I get a follow-up invitation tonight. Of course it's referring to me. And this is pride. Pride blinds us to the value of others. Pride blinds us to the work, the wonderful work that other people do. 
Pride stops us from seeing the whole picture. It puts blinders on us, and it restricts us, and it exaggerates our strengths, and it exaggerates our achievement. Pride completely deceives the whole person, the whole person. And it promises grandeur, but it leads to a pit. It always does. Now, Haman may be the king's favorite man, but let the king say that. Let other people say that. Proverbs 27.2 says, Let another man praise you, not your own mouth, and a stranger, not your own lips. And we see now what happens next. Pride is never confined to the heart. Pride always has an outlet, and it will always undo us. Have a look at verses 7 and 9. So Haman answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, here's what you should do. Have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. So, so look, what, look what Haman desires for himself. He doesn't desire wealth. He's already got plenty of money. He doesn't desire possessions. He's already got plenty of possessions. What does he want? I want to wear the king's robe. And I want to, I want to ride on the king's horse. And I want one of the nobles, one of the highest men in, in, in the empire, I want them to lead me around the city on the king's horse and in his clothes. And I want that noble to shout to all the people in the streets, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. I want him to parade me through the streets. That's what I want. Do You see, he desires the splendor of the king conferred to himself. That that's what he's after. And friends, is that not a picture of every sinful heart? We humans, here's our sickness. We desire the splendor of the God King conferred to ourselves. We want to be Lord. We want the authority. We want to make the decisions. We want to be praised. We would write our own prayer. Hallowed be our name. My kingdom come. My will be done. For mine is the glory, the kingdom, the power forever and ever. Amen. That is our sickness. This sin. And friends, this is what, this is what the TV shows that we watch promotes. This is what is valued and endorsed and pushed upon our children. This is what we are facing and what the world endorses. And friends, this is the disease, the sinful disease that courses through our veins. My happiness, my wants, my desires, me, 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 me. Not him, him, him. It's pride. As you look at this, everything that Haman's requested for himself, are you speechless? When you look at the height of his pride, Friend, tonight, do not marvel at Haman. Marvel at yourself. Be appalled at me and be appalled at you. Because this is a picture of us. This is a picture of pride, of creatures made from the dust who wants the glory of God for themselves. The clay wanting to be the potter. Paul, the holiest, the Apostle Paul, the holiest amongst us, he said, wretched man that I am in Romans 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? How greatly we need to be delivered from ourselves, from our sin. How does God tell us to think about ourselves? What's God's wisdom? What's the truth? God says this in Romans 12, 3. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment. 
with sober judgment. See, the person who understands that they deserve nothing good from God, they've sinned against God, the person who recognizes that they deserve nothing good from God, they are the ones that marvel at the grace of God that they've received in Christ. They cannot believe it. It's unfathomable. So pride will undo us. Look at verse 10. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you've suggested. Haman's eyes are lighting up at this point. (laughs) He's got the Midas touch. Continue. Do just as you've commanded for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. Now, can you just imagine the utter disbelief and shock on Haman's face at this point? Just the change in a second. His jaw on the floor. He cannot believe it. And look at the scene that's painted before us. Verse 11. This is remarkable. Verse 11. So Haman got the robe and the horse, and he robed Mordecai, and he led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. What a scene. Now, let's just think about it from the, two, the perspectives of the two men here. Think about that event from Haman's perspective. The man that the king delights in is Mordecai, the Jew, who Haman hates. Haman couldn't stand the fact that Mordecai wouldn't bow to him. Now he's got to take him into the rooms and he needs to dress, personally dress Mordecai in the king's clothes. He's got to mount him on the horse and in front of everyone he has to parade and celebrate his arch enemy. See, this was supposed to be, it was shaping to be the greatest day of his life. It's becoming an unforgettable nightmare. It's horrendous. But how would this have all seemed to Mordecai? Now, this is the interesting part. How would Mordecai have processed this event? Think about it. Just days earlier, the king had signed a decree that all the Jews, including himself, are going to be killed. So what do we read in earlier chapters? When Mordecai heard it, just days earlier, he went and he tore his clothes in grief, and he was, he was in sackcloth, rags. And now, a few days later, he's wearing the king's robes. A few days earlier, he, it says he went out into the streets, wailing and weeping loudly, crying through the streets. And now he is riding the king's horse, and he is being honored as the king's favorite. Mordecai must be thinking, what on earth is going on? He must be in awe of the providence of God. Absolutely in awe of the God who orders all things. This is Mordecai. The Lord is doing more than what we see always, always. And it's the same for us. The Lord is working in our lives. So we've seen an unexpected night. An unexpected day. Last point this evening, just as we draw to a close. An unexpected future. An unexpected future. Now, look at how Mordecai and Haman respond to the day's event. Look at verse 12. So, that that big parade has just finished. Look at verse 12. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. What does Mordecai do What does he do after he receives this honor? He doesn't think he's now entitled to a position in the king's palace. He doesn't walk into the palace now with the king's robe thinking, okay, so what's my new role? Okay, where's my throne? Where am I going to be sitting? And and what am I in charge of? doesn't do that. He doesn't seek that. It says he just returns to the king's gate. He just goes back to being a servant, just being a doorkeeper. He returns to his post. See, he's little affected by all the honor, all the fuss made about him. He's he's portrayed as just little affected. It didn't mean much to him because he never sought that. That's not what he valued. That's not what he's after. What is Mordecai after? I want my people saved. I want my people saved. That's what he's concerned for. God knows Mordecai doesn't want the honor. God knows that 
And God knows that Mordecai wants him to rescue his people. God knows that. And yet, God is going to rescue the people, but God still chooses to honor Mordecai. Why does God do that? All Mordecai wants is to save my people. But God says, I'm going to also honor you in front of everyone. Why does God do that? Now, we're not told explicitly, but perhaps it seems that this is a token of God's grace to, to Mordecai. And it's a sign, almost a foreshadowing, a sign saying, this is what's going to happen for my people. This is a glimpse. You who are about to be destroyed, you are going to be triumphant. My people are going to triumph over the enemies. Your enemy is going to lead you through the streets praising your name. And my people as a whole are going to triumph over the enemies. And we're going to see that at the end of the book. It's just a foreshadowing of what God's promising. Christian, in our walk, in our Christian walk, we have moments where we see progress, where we see growth, where we overcome sins and addictions that have just plagued us for so long. Or, or great perseverance, a really unexpected event comes in our life that breaks our heart. And, and we come through it, and we come through it strong. These are tokens from God. These are messages from God, promises and reminders, messages from Him that He will certainly bring us to the heavenly city. He will finish the work that He began in us, the saving work that He started. You know, it's a privilege as, as pastors here to see this growth in a number of you where you have these victories, where you start growing in personal evangelism, you start growing in the knowledge of God, you start getting excited about the work of the Lord. These are all tokens of God's grace, and it's Him showing you this is just a foretaste. I will bring you home to me safely. And that's what we see with Mordecai here, this honoring and parading through the streets. It's just a glimpse of God saying, this is what's going to happen to my people. And this prom these promises come from Him who cannot lie, our God. And so God honors Mordecai, how does Haman process the day's events? That was Mordecai. How does Haman leave the day's events? Look at verses 12 and 13. Haman rushed home, verse 12. Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief, and he told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that happened to him. It says he went home, rushed home, with his head covered in grief. You know when you turn on the news and someone who's been charged with a crime and they're in the car and they're pulling up to the courthouse and the car door opens and all the camera all the media is flashing photos at them and the person comes out they're trying to cover their head and they don't want to be seen they don't want their, their face past it everywhere that's what Haman's doing he wants to crawl and hide under a rock he is so shamed he is so humiliated and he's hiding himself he has fallen so far like when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And Jesus went on to say, For everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now just remember, the third point in our sermon here that we're currently in is an unexpected future. Haman goes home and he tells his wife and his friends everything that happens. He goes to those who are closest to him. So he goes to his family and friends. You'd expect that they'd have a word of comfort to him. It's her husband. You'd expect that there would be some kind of hope, a glass half full. It's okay. It's not going to be like you think. God takes away from Haman his closest comforts. This is the unexpected future. Have a look at verse 13, the second half. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai is before, before whom your downfall has started is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Why is this so unexpected? Because in the previous chapter, his wife told him, You're so upset about Mordecai. Build the gallows. Kill the man. Then go enjoy the banquet. The very next day, his wife pronounces his doom she becomes a prophet of God to him you will come to ruin you cannot stand against Mordecai you will be ruined pronounces judgment upon him imagine hearing those words from the mouth of your wife and the wording this is where it's important notice the wording 
What does she say? Since Mordecai, have a look at it, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. What's God saying through Haman's wife? What's, what's God saying? God is reminding of an ancient promise a thousand years earlier that he made to Abraham. What did God say to Abraham? Those who bless you, I will bless. But those who curse you, I will curse. And that's what's falling upon him. Haman sought to kill God's people. Haman sought to kill one of God's children. And by Satan, Haman sought to try and kill Messiah from coming into the world, to kill the Jews. But understand this, there will be always consequences when people pick a fight with God's children. There will always be consequences when the world declares war on the people of God, always, always. Husbands, if you saw a bunch of men lay hands on your wife to assault her, would you sit back and do nothing? Parents in the room, if you saw a bunch of men lay hold of your child to abuse your child, would you sit and turn a blind eye? Never. I remember when Brooke and I were at the previous church, a couple from the church invited us over for dinner, and they had a young child. We were going to the same church, and the mother, she was saying to us, she, she was telling us a story of when she was at the local shopping center. And she walked into one of the shops. She had a baby in the pram. And while she was looking, a man walked past, and he tried to grab the baby out of the pram. And as he pulled the baby, he didn't realize that the baby was harnessed in. And he didn't have time to unclip the baby. So he grabbed the whole pram, ran out of that little shop, and took off. Brooke and I listened in horror and, and managed to get out. What did, what did you do? She looked at us and she said, I ran out of that shop through the shopping center screaming at the top of my lungs, my baby, my baby, he's taken my baby. And everyone stopped and looked at the man. Everyone was looking and he ended up leaving the pram behind and he took off. Now what she did didn't surprise me at all. I'd expect every parent in this room to do the same thing. But understand this. Do we, parents, love our children more than God loves his children? No. There will be consequences. There will be consequences. Those who curse you, I will curse. He loves his children. And God speaks through Zeresh and says, Haman, you're going to come to ruin. And God's even prophesying forward, Satan, you will come to ruin. Your plans will not stand against Messiah and salvation in this world. And as you look at this, if ever, if ever, when all of this is said to Haman, if ever there was a time to repent of your wickedness, if ever there was a moment to realize what you've done and your great sin, this was the moment to acknowledge it. God has spoken even through my wife. She's different. He's confronted me. He's pronounced my doom. Now's the time. This is it. But now we arrive at the final verse of the passage. And it is absolutely terrifying. It is terrifying. Look at verse 14. While they were still talking with Haman, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared as he's with his wife and advisors and they're talking, it says, while they were still talking about all of this going on, while he's trying to process just how quickly his life is unraveling, while he's doing that, while they're speaking, there's a knock on the door. And the king's servants are there. And now they're taking him to the banquet and they're escorting him there. And it says they hurry him out. Do you honestly think at this moment, Haman really wanted to go to the banquet to be with the king. Do you honestly think he really wanted to go? But what does the text say? They came and they hurried him away. Hurried him away. It's all so quick. And who's, who does it say is waiting for him? The banquet that Esther had prepared. He had been plotting 
the destruction of Mordecai and now he's being escorted to a banquet where someone is planning his destruction. He doesn't know. When they come and grab him, he doesn't know that he's walking to his grave. He does not know what is ahead for him. In verse 14, as I look at it, it just terrifies me because he's confronted about his sin, but there's no time to reflect. There's no time to process. There's no time to think, to mend my ways. Am I going to change? Maybe I should seek the God of Mordecai. He's exposed me and laid me bare. But it just says, the text says, they hurried him away. It's all so fast. Do you hear God tonight? You who are sitting here, do you think life is great, life is wonderful, I just want to have fun? Or do you think, you know what, yeah, there might be God, but I've got plenty of time. Do you hear God tonight? They hurried him away. There was no time. He missed the day of opportunity. He missed the day of salvation. And now he's walking to his grave. And in a moment, he's going to be standing before God. It's just so quick. And it's haunting. And he leaves his home. And he leaves his family. And he leaves his friends for the last time. And he walks to his grave unknowingly. Friends, if that's you, please, if you are not right with God, if, if your sin hasn't been forgiven, if you don't know where you're going when you die, heaven or hell, if you don't trust in Christ, don't delay. Because you may find when you really want to consider it, time may be taken away from you. And even when you start thinking about it, there might be a knock on the door and God says, your time is up. Not everyone lives to 100 not everyone does, and you might be hurried away to stand before God, and it's too late. The king couldn't sleep that night because God was at work, and God had good purposes in that. For some of you, I hope tonight that God takes sleep away from you. I hope he does, that you look at this text, and he bothers you tonight. God did it to save Mordecai's life, and may God do it to save your life tonight. And if you're a Christian, if you are a Christian, let's come full, full circle to where we started tonight. As you look at this world, it seems so chaotic. Can you imagine when all of these events finished, right? Mordecai's been paraded around the city. What do you think the people of the city were thinking? The people of the city must be thinking, what on earth is going on in this kingdom? A few days ago, out of nowhere, the king signs a decree to kill all the Jews in a few months. And it said the whole city was bewildered. Now, the king takes a Jew, puts him on a horse, parades him as his favorite man that he's honored. What on earth is going on in this kingdom? How turbulent is it? How unstable, how unsafe is this place? The king doesn't know what he's doing. He's lost control. That's how people are thinking. And unfortunately, that's how Christians are starting to think regarding our world because things are so bad. Friends, things are not chaos. They're not out of control. They're in perfect control. This is our Father's world. And He is working in all the details. You won't see Him on the news, but He's at work. Trust in Him. He's at work in your life. And He's at work in my life. He's at work in unbelievers. Trust in him. Trust in him. Let me pray. Father, we, we want to acknowledge that we've missed you in the details. And we so want to see the spectacular. You, we want you to write your name in the sky. We want you to do fantastic miracles. We want you to appear physically. All these big things. And we live like practical atheists. Forgive us for, for missing just how at work you are in our lives. From our sleep patterns to the decisions that we make for work. Our relationships the victories and falls in sin and addiction, the troubles in our relationships, all, all these things, God. 
We pray that you would use your word tonight, what you have shown us, and that you would encourage us, and that we would not be fearful, that we'd not be afraid when we hear of wars and troubles, but that we know that you're in perfect control and you are bringing everything to a glorious conclusion when Jesus shall return and take us to be with him. And God, I just pray for any who don't know you, who do not follow Christ, your son, who haven't received his forgiveness and believed on him for salvation. I pray for them, God, that they would stop and consider while they still have time tonight, that they would learn from Haman and that they would run to you and run to you quickly, acknowledging sin and trusting in your son. Lord, we thank you for our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close with the final song.